I would like to now welcome Professor Philip Wong, William R. and Ines Kerr Bell Professor, Stanford University. Welcome, Professor. Professor Philip Wong joined Stanford in 2004 after 16 years at IBM Research with appointments as research staff member, manager, and senior manager while at IBM. He was responsible for shaping and executing IBM's strategy on nanoscale science and technology and silicon technology. His interests are in the area of nanoscale science and technology, semiconductor technology, solid state devices, and electronic imaging. His present research covers a broad range of topics, including carbon electronics, 2D layered materials, wireless implantable biosensors, directed self-assembly, nano-electrical mechanical relays, device modeling, brain-inspired computing, and non-volatile memory devices, such as phase change memory and metal oxide resistance change memory. Wow, it almost feels like I've encompassed the whole world in this, Professor. It's just amazing to hear this. And it's our pleasure to hear a few words from you on the reimagining re semiconductors for our grandchildren's world. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see the slides that's on, on the screen. And I uh, want to thank the organizer for inviting me to give this talk today. I'd like to spend a few minutes today and talk about how to imagine semiconductor technology for a grandchildren's world. Why go grandchildren's world? Well, there's two generations of humanity, uh, 50 years. 50 years ago, when the microprocessor was just born, microchips had about 2,000 transistors. The personal computer was at its infancy. A mere generation ago, the first cell phones appeared that had the ability to browse the internet, although in a very rudimentary way. Today, through continuous advancements in technology, our mobile phones have far more compute power than one that landed Apollo 11 on the moon weighing that was weighing a whopping 70 pounds. The point is, a lot can change in two generations. This revolution actually goes back more than 60 years to the invention of a way to put many semiconductor devices on the same chip, the integrated circuit. Throughout the years that followed, semiconductor technology advanced through continuous miniaturization in particular, two-dimensional miniaturization, which involved fitting more transistors or more devices on an integrated circuit, as predicted by Gordon Moore in 1965. This two-dimensional miniaturization gives rise to a very important key attribute, which is the semiconductor technology and the integrated circuit has been, relents has been a relentless reduction of cost per function. This continuous cost reduction led to ubiquitous deployment of semiconductor technologies over time. The picture phone that was first commercialized in 1970 by AT&T Bell Labs had less than 500 customers. Without ubiquitous deployment at the network that it immersed, it would be impossible to make work from home, online learning, and the sharing economy or streaming delivery of entertainment a reality today. The worldwide lockdown brought on by COVID-19 in 2020 were a turning point for technology innovation. More than 10 years worth of digitization remote work, online education, and e-commerce happened in a single year. At the current pace, annual semiconductor revenue will grow to more than a trillion dollars by 2030, directly contributing to about three to four trillion dollars of global electronics growth. Yet, the promise of continuous cost reduction has created an expectation that underestimates the value of semiconductors. 
as the recent semiconductor supply chain challenge so clearly illustrates, semiconductors are everywhere and fulfill a valuable and vital role in modern society. As computing devices become ubiquitous, the amount of data generated and communicated across a global network, often in real time, has grown exponentially. To keep up with this growth, high-performance computing, or HPC, carried out in servers in big data centers, have become crucial and is seeing explosive growth. High-performance computing is the ability to process data and perform complex calculations at high speeds to solve performance-intensive problems. Today, high-performance computing has already surpassed the smartphone as the growth driver. It is the fastest growing segment of the semiconductor industry, so much that it will soon be supported by dedicated fabrication technologies. The integration of the virtual with the physical world will bring about a sea change in the way society interacts with one another and will be enabled by applications of high-performance computing. In addition to the multitude of sensors and actuators made of semiconductors, this integration of the virtual and the physical worlds requires hardware-like smart appliances, wearable devices, Internet of Things, and technologies like 5G, AI, and big data analytics for communicating and understanding information and decision-making. For each of these applications, the semiconductor content and the value it provides will increase rapidly. It is estimated that the semiconductor industry will grow more than twice as much as the electronics market. Semiconductors will imbue intelligence and new functionalities into more and more products, elevating the value of such products. To give an example, an, autonom an autonomous driving vehicle will be safer and more energy efficient and has more semiconductor content than any other models without this intelligent capability. And it would require extremely energy efficient semiconductor chips for functions such as AI for autonomous driving. So society is also expecting new user applications beyond what we can imagine today. Personalized and community medicine, as well as vaccine and drug discovery, will get a boost from the computing power provided by semiconductors. Combating disinformation on social media, we'll need better algorithms and the compute power for training the AI models. As an example, one of the most advanced AI language models for creating realistic human quality text, the GPT-3, requires 300 zettafrops to train on high performance compute cloud. In return, the capability enabled by this AI language model can be quite impressive. GPT-3 was recently used by Kevin Roos, a tech columnist for the New York Times, to complete a book reveal. AI is often thought of as a technology involving primarily software and algorithms. Yet, hardware technology is what opens the door to the virtual world and allows us to do use this information derived from AI. Thus, even in the metaverse, the physical takes center stage. As semiconductor technology advances to meet the needs of the 5G and AI era, energy efficiency has become the most important metric, not only because computing power is already throttled by the inability to remove heat from the chip, but also because the global energy use of computing escalates faster than any other application area. 
energy efficiency of computing due to semiconductor technology alone has been advancing at a rapid pace at about two times every two years. And there is a shared optimism that this technology will continue to advance like clockwork as the past 50 years did. This shared optimism that is often conflated with Moore's law is perhaps more important than the law itself. It is this shared optimism by the industry and the society at large that has propelled the industry to meet the challenge and make the prophecy a self-fulfilling one. Let us look in the real real mirror and see how 50 years, that's two generations of humanity, have changed the way we work and the way we communicate with one another. It is a totally different world from the days of the first cell phones to today's smartphones. In the next 50 years, our grandchildren will likely use virtual and augmented reality, VR and AR, as the principal means of interaction with the world. Yet, today's VR AR headsets weigh more than 500 grams, the battery life is less than two to three hours, and the price is high, which remind us of the cell phones of 25 years ago. To achieve the same level of ubiquity as today's cell phone, VR AR devices we need to improve by more than 100 times. And this can only be done with continuous advancement of semiconductor technology. The upcoming decades will be a golden era for the semiconductor industry. Over the past 50 years, the development of semiconductor technology has been akin to walking inside a tunnel. The way ahead was clear as there was a well-defined path and everyone knew what needed to be done, shrinking the transistor by two-dimensional miniaturization. Now, we are approaching the exit of the tunnel. There are many more possibilities outside the tunnel. New paths made possible by innovations from materials to architecture, and new destinations defined by new applications. We are no longer bound by the confines of the tunnel, which now provides unlimited room for unleashing innovation. Then this is the end of my talk and thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. Before I close, I'd like to thank my graduating PhD students, Ms. Sing Zheng, who will be graduating this year, and my colleagues at TSMC, as well as my sponsors at Stanford, uh, that they support my work at Stanford, the National Science Foundation, DARPA, Semiconductor Research Corporation, the JUMP program, and in particular, the Accent Center, in which I'm part of, and the Stanford Systemics Alliance, which has 38 member companies, as well as the Stanford Non-Volatile Memory Technology Research Initiative, supported by six member companies. With that, I'd like to close and like to thank you for inviting me to give this talk today, and I'm happy to answer questions for you. Thank you so much, Professor. It was such an uh, enlightening conversation. And, and uh, uh, you know, I think we would have a lot of questions for you. We probably should have you over uh, sometime uh, again. But uh, maybe I'll start with a couple of questions today. Uh, you know, you spoke about our grandchildren's world, right? And uh, I have a nine-year-old and I'm constantly worried when, you know, she's uh, with devices and looking at various gadgets and, and literally getting immersed into that world, right? I mean, possessions in a virtual world are possessions, real possessions for them. And it's a very different world that we can already see opening up. Uh, what, according to you, would global education look like, uh, let's say in 2030 or 2040, right? Uh, because I'm assuming, like you said, AR, VR would become way more mature, more energy efficient by then. We would have, uh, you know, AI getting mature, 5G, um, you know, further standards of, uh, you know, networking and communication. How would you envision global education um, around 2030 or 2040? I asked a similar question um, to Vishwani, sir, and, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. 
Wonderful question.、Uh, of course, I don't have no crystal ball, but I could offer some thoughts.、Um, you know, we already have seen that、uh, with the pandemic and、uh, the with the assistance of technology,、uh, many of these education functions can be conducted remotely. Although not with the same effect as what would have、uh, when we are dealing and talking to students one on one and、uh, in in a classroom. Yet, this is better than nothing, and so I think the、um, the broad adoption of technology into in the education world would lead to a further democratization of education around the world. And today, if you look at the Educated uh, uh, cohort of students. This is still a very small fraction of the general population around the world, and there are still a lot of、uh, people in the, around the world who did not have or do not have the、uh, ability to get access to education in whatever form, either by reading a set of class notes or watching a video of a presentation, and so on. I think that with the All the ways that we can do to communicate、uh, around the world electronically, and the ubiquitous deployment of devices that people get get access to, then education will be further democratized. And I also also want to emphasize this ubiquitous is clearly important, and、uh, because without the ubiquity, that you would not be able to perform a lot of the Of functions that you would like to see in a network as well.、Uh, for example, in a online class, then if you have a lot of students, you could if you could have a very good feel or for what the students generally are not understanding.、Uh, whereas if you have a very small sample, very small population, that would be very hard to achieve. So this ubiquitous. Uh, uh, Access to education would lead to a、uh, a refinement of the quality of education. So it's like a, a very、uh, desirable virtuous cycle and feedback mechanism that you can see. I think that is actually a a very insightful answer, and I agree with you. I think you know maybe ten twenty years down the line, if education is no more a privilege. But is the norm? Then I think, as technologists, a lot of us would feel really good about the work we've done.、Um, one quick,、uh, another question for you, Professor. So you know, today we know that AI is nowhere close to the human brain as yet. And、uh, how do you see us, you know, trusting AI for technologies like you know, driverless cars, autonomous、uh, driving, and How do you tie that up also with the energy efficient story that you brought up in your address? Very good question, and I think much of the、uh, I wouldn't call it shortcomings, but much of the gap between our expectation of what AI can do versus what AI actually can do today. The much of the gap. Is of course that due to a lack of understanding about AI algorithm, but also due to the fact、uh, that the compute platform is、uh, not energy efficient enough, not fast enough. As you probably all of us、uh, in this conference know, the recent、uh, advances in AI are due to three things: one, the availability of data, lots of data; number two. New invention of new algorithms and、uh, to,、uh, new architecture, and number three, that the advanced continuous advances of, com- of computing power, and that of course goes along with computing efficiency, because you cannot talk about compute speed without talking about how much energy or how much power it draws. So, out of the three things, other than the、uh, development of AI algorithms, out of the three things. Two of them are related to semiconductor technology. The way that the compute power has been improving and energy efficiency has been improving has brought about the AI, AI revolution that we see today. And today,、uh, the AI 
algorithms are actually held back by the availability of uh, energy efficient computing. And the second piece of it, which is the generation and, and, and collection of data also is uh, enabled by the ubiquitous deployment of semiconductor technologies. Imagine that uh, we, will not, we do not have any cell phones to pick pictures at random places. We would not have a huge trove of, fit, of photos for us to learn from and, and, uh, and data to learn from. So the ubiquitous deployment of semiconductor technologies lead to the collection and the ease of collection of huge amount of data, which is required or in many cases essential for AI algorithms to work properly. So going forward, semiconductor technology is going to be even more important, a very important underpinning for the further development of AI, not only in the, in the energy efficient computing aspects, but also in further uh, broadening the deployment devices around the world, uh, uh, the IOTs, the devices people use to interact with each other. And uh, so those will be extremely important to as a, an enabler for further advancement of AI. I think that's, uh, it's actually a very thoughtful answer and a lot to think about. And uh, I think this would also be a great, uh, you know, uh, food for thought for a lot of us engineers to see what is it that we can do to take it in the right direction. Um, once again, I thank you so much. Uh, like I mentioned to Sambit before, there are a lot of questions coming up, but we're uh, unfortunately also limited with our time. But we would love to, you know, hear and learn from you again. Uh, but thank you so much, Professor, for making time and coming and, you know, giving us this address today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I wish one day I could come uh, very shortly. I could come to India and uh, meet everyone here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.